Mr. Keller, the gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. First, I would like to thank our military, our Capitol Police and law enforcement for the outstanding job they did on January 6th and the outstanding job they do every day. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. However, it's troubling that the Capitol Police are not present at this hearing. Without their input, we cannot comprehensively improve security measures, increase transparency and in communications, and ensure the events of January 6th never happen again. So, um, General Pyatt, uh, does the National Guard have authority to assist the Capitol Police on its own accord? It does not, Congressman. It requires the Secretary of Defense to approve support to uh, federal law enforcement. But if the Secretary of Defense says go down to the Capitol, can they do it without being asked? We need to have a request first from those entities, and those requests were asked for uh, if, if there was needed support in the days leading up to 6 January, and we were told they, they were not need any support. So you can't just show up at the Capitol and say, I want to provide help. You have to be asked by the Capitol Police? Yes, Congressman. So you have to be requested. And as you mentioned, uh, the Pentagon had asked the Capitol Police if they needed help leading up, um, needed help from the National Guard leading up to January 6th. Uh, it's my understanding uh, they were asked on December 31st, 2020, if they needed any assistance. I'm try we got the request from the mayor. Mayor Bowser was drafted on 31st of December. The request from DOD to the Capitol Police if they needed any assistance came on the 3rd. And then on the 4th, the Secretary of the Army asked the Capitol Police if they needed assistance, and they replied they did not. On each occasion? On each occasion, sir. Okay. And the intelligence bulletin that uh, Dr. Fox, our colleague from North Carolina, uh, asked about, that was shared with the Capitol Police on January 5th? Congressman, we, we do not collect, the Army does not collect intelligence on oh, excuse me, that's actually, we had. Yeah, excuse me, that, that's Secretary Ray. Um, you had the, uh, the uh, from the field office in Norfolk, you, that was shared with the Capitol Police on uh, January 5th? Uh, yes, sir, in, in uh, three different ways. Thank you. And, and uh, General Pyatt, you were not asked for assistance on January 5th? We were not asked for assistance on January 5th, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, so I presume if you're, if you're not going to circumvent the chain of command, can you please walk us through the timing of the troop mobilization from the moment the Army received the official request for assistance from the Capitol Police Board? That, that, that assistance request, that request came on the 2.30 phone, phone call and immediately Secretary McCarthy knew that it was urgent and it was required and he ran down the hall to get that approval. We had approval by 3 o'clock and we had mobilization approval by 3.04. What we didn't have is we, di we didn't have a plan to get them remissioned to get them now to be able to respond to what the Capitol Police needed. There was never a doubt they needed it. Once that report came in, we could see that the perimeter had collapsed and the Capitol was, was breached. They needed it. We needed to get soldiers now re-equipped and reconfigured for this new mission. And had the Capitol Police asked for help on any of the occasions prior to that, you would have been able to have people on the ground at the Capitol on January 6th before anything happened? That is our recommendation. We, we should have had this plan before January 6th. That way we would have had a lead federal agency and an integrated security plan. Thank you, uh, General Pyatt and Director Ray. Um, I, I thank you both for your service on January 6th as well as the duration of your time. Uh, I just, I just want to say that if the Democrats are serious as they say they are in investigating the events of January 6th, then they'll join committee Republicans in calling the Capitol Police to testify. We need to make sure we know what happened. And it really baffles me, and I think it baffles much of America, why the people that were in charge of protecting the Capitol have not been at either of the hearings we've had so far. Um, uh, the chief, now, uh, Officer Pittman, was in charge of intelligence, intelligence and protective services on January 6th and before. Now, now Officer Pittman is in charge of the Capitol Police. I think if anybody wants to find the truth, you should be calling that witness so that we can ask the questions on what they did, what she did with the information she received on January 5th and why she didn't request help 
from her superiors go to the Capitol Board? What's, what, what does the Capitol Police do when they get an assessment? And, and that really needs to be investigated also. And we shouldn't be waiting until the tail end. The only reason they're calling uh, the Capitol Police is because the Republicans insisted they do it. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so much. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, that, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring uh, vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it 
via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy... Is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.